Greetings, English language teachers worldwide. That's right, it's time once again for an American TESOL Institute webinar. Today, it's top 10 tips for teaching adjectives. You may have noticed we have a series here. If you haven't noticed, you can go back and check it out. We started with tips for teaching verbs, moved on to tips for teaching nouns. Here we are with adjectives. I like to start these webinars with this question. In this case, uh, I'm putting adjectives there <laughs> before it was nouns and verbs. So what do you think? And this is based on the COCA, which is the Corpus of Contemporary American English. It's based on uh, spoken American English. And that includes uh, a heavy dose, or not dose is right the word, but you know, uh, a, a lot of data from uh, journalism. So it's not, you know, when you hear spoken American English, it's it's not as if it's, you know, completely just, you know, everyday natural conversational English. It's not that at all, although there is that included. But what do you think, adjective wise? 10, meaning 10%, less, more? Let's check. Ooh. <laughs> Looks like it's 2%. Other new, good, high, old, great, big American. And you see how American is in that list uh, because it's the corpus of American English and includes the media. Tip number one, know the most high frequency adjectives in English and more to the point, the adjectives that your students want to learn, have to learn, need to learn, want to learn uh, is optimal, have to learn is maybe less optimal, need to learn maybe somewhere in the middle. There it is, other new, good, high, old, great, big, America, small, large, national, young, different, black, long, little, important, political, okay. Uh, this list is useful, but of course, it's not something that should be uh, anything more than a guide. Um, as I said, what's really important is you, your students, your syllabus, uh, which adjectives are most uh, <clears throat> important for your students to, to understand and be able to use uh, naturally when they are speaking, when they are writing, uh, to be able to recognize them when they listen, when they read. But anyway, here is the list of the top 100 in the COCA. Tip number two, teach the most useful adjective noun collocations. If you've been watching uh, these webinars uh, on verbs and nouns, you'll well, you won't be surprised by this one, tip number two. By the way, these are not ranked uh, according to most important, least important, anything like this. Um, but yes, it is, of course, super, super important to not teach adjectives uh, in isolation or any words in isolation. How do the words connect? How do they chunk? Uh, what, what occurs with, you know, high frequency uh, in, in English? And adjectives what are they we didn't start off with a definition because i feel like most of you probably know what they are <clears throat> uh, words that describe nouns uh, qualify nouns uh, sometimes express quantity of nouns um, but even that is kind of simplistic because it sort of implies that okay it's just the adjective plus noun however adjective plus noun meaning the adjective coming before uh the noun those are the most common uh, uses of adjectives, so we should really get into this right away. You could give students something like this at low levels and see what they come up with, right? Why did I choose those adjectives? Because they are so common, but you could choose different adjectives. Here, I'm focusing on uncountable, sorry, countable nouns. <laughs> yes. Countable, there we go. And that's why I have an article here before the adjective, because we're going to modify a singular noun. But look at other, which is the most common adjective. And I love that since another other is often an issue. Ooh, other people, other ways, other things, other prices, other ideas. Other is so common. Another, another not as common. And then <clears throat> it could be which nouns go together with these adjectives, and then, well, how many do they work with the 
you know, <laughs> can you mix and match? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Can we do a new thing, a new price, a new idea? Yes, but how about a highway? Well, there's you drive on a highway, but that's not really right. So I don't have it set up here so that these all collocate, of course, with the nouns, but just going across a new way. What else is new? Oh, a new car, a new friend, and so forth. Uncountable nouns. I love opportunities to, to teach countable and uncountable that are not traditional. And here's one, having students think of uncountable nouns that go. And if they are at the level where it's about distinguishing between those two, it could be just where you are helping them sort them out where here there's an article and here there isn't or you could play with the plurals. Anyway, I love opportunities to play around with singular plural when it's not just a lesson on uh, the grammar, but more looking at vocabulary. So here we have other advice. And I think here, right, other information, other, other timing. So this is, could be with higher levels, interesting to think which ones go with uh, just the one <laughs> here, or we could mix and match. Don't forget about adjectives and prepositions. So there's the whole adjective phrase uh, idea and, you know, adjective phrases could just be, right, uh, a noun and an adjective as we saw, or it could be as we will see noun plus infinitive, uh, for example. Um, I don't want to put adjective and prepositions into a separate category. Why? Because really we need to remember those prepositions together with the adjectives as a chunk. The worst thing I think for students, uh, anyone learning English, is to separate things and then have to guess at what goes back together, right? So yes, we have a, you know a good idea, a good way, right? Good is obviously goes as an adjective without a preposition, but how about good at as one chunk? Afraid of, similar to, serious about, full of. Interesting, isn't it, that just choosing, uh, not at random, looking at the frequency list, but, you know, high frequency adjectives that take prepositions, we already have here, uh, you know, at, of, to, and about. Uh, I didn't even try. I could have found one with with, <laughs> right, to to demonstrate uh, that there's so many different prepositions that it, with, with adjectives that are common. Anyway, the point is, don't break them up. Instead, give students something like this, or if they're lower level, give them something like that. And after that, they can maybe think of other ideas. And then, needless to say, but I should say it, because when I don't, <laughs> I think people are thinking, is this guy just talking about, you know, charts and lists? Make sentences. Right. It should be in context. But, you know, good at sports, it's not difficult to find that in context. So here I'm pulling things uh, out of context, not independent of context. Right. I'm ho I hope <laughs> either in your textbooks, in your own materials or in uh, realia materials you're getting out there, you're finding collocations like this. But what else could it be good at sports, good at oof, so many other ideas, right? Afraid of what are you afraid of? So to put it more in context, make it more personal, should not be an issue. Here we go with tip three, teach the most useful adjective and adjective phrases. So here is something I referred to a few minutes ago, some collocation idea, so important. Why? Look at these high frequency adjectives and how often they're in adjective phrases with infinitives. So stepping back for a moment, it doesn't mean that the adjectives plus prepositions aren't important. And it's important to point out that sometimes it's both afraid of dogs, but afraid to be around dogs, right? What's really important then is to understand that this type of collocation not just learning the adjective independently, but chunking it either preposition noun or here with an infinitive. This is uh, the language that's 
out there, whether it's in a story, whether it's in an article in the newspaper, whether it's something your students want to say uh, from their own language into English. And we know, or I think you know, or if you don't know, I'll tell you <laughs> that uh, infinitives and gerunds, wow, it's really confusing and crazy And when you translate. But when you just think of it more in terms of chunking and collocation, it's a vocabulary item. It's not uh, thinking about it from a, a grammar perspective. Do you or do you not agree that these adjectives collocate very nicely in these adjective phrases with infinitives? I believe we can go down the line, easy to do, easy to have, easy to see, easy to say, easy to get, no? Well, I tested them out, but it wasn't hard to make a list like this. You can really play with the most common adjectives and the most common verbs and find so many high frequency phrases. So what could you do with this? Again, it could be where your students are trying, oops, excuse me, where your students are trying to think of verbs that go with all of these, or you go directly here. But the point in the end, right, is that they're able to latch on to these collocations and write their own sentences or say their own, uh, express what they want to say, speaking or writing. Um, and this will be <laughs> immediately helpful. Oh, there's an adverb adjective collocation. We're going to get to those soon. Tip number four. <laughs> this is a big one. You know, it's funny because I teach in France. And in France, the way the grammar works, it's, there's something similar going on with the suffixes for adjectives when something is, you know, interesting to you, but I am interested in it, right? With the, partic the present participle and the past participle of the verb. However, even here, students make mistakes the way a Spanish speaker, for example, would make mistakes. So I had in the past many uh, students whose first language was Spanish or Portuguese, where uh, it was not easy to, to figure this out. But even when a language has something similar grammatically, I have students saying, you know, uh, I, I was boring instead of I was bored. So how can you explain? Well, partly the first thing is, you know, the whole concept of, you know, the difference between uh, a person who is bored and a person who is boring, just to stay with, with that uh, adjective coming from the verb, to bore. How often do we bore people? <laughs> Sometimes. But the reason this is super, super important and why it needs to be thought of, I feel strongly as uh, these are adjectives, is that the adjectives are in many, many cases uh, more common than the verbs. Think about the verb to tire, if you even think about it as a verb. <laughs> and if you say, well, I am tired is passive voice, we can get into, you know, linguistically, like the technicalities of that, but how about people learning English? Is it useful to think about that as a verb or an adjective? It's an adjective. So let's get into it. This is something that you may or may not want to use with students, depending on who your students are, but I strongly suggest something like this uh, for you as a teacher to make sure you are okay with. So we have the verb to interest somebody. Right. Uh, but, you know, can I interest you in a cup of coffee? <laughs> okay. The verb is not as common as its use as a as a participle, whether it's an uh, ing or an ed participle. So for many learners, especially young learners, but I encourage you to do this with older learners, too. Uh, a great approach is just thinking about them as adjectives so you can sort of heighten their awareness, if you must, that they come from verbs. So here we have this verb interests me, bored me, confuses me. But even here, this book is interesting. Is that present continuous? Already we have a participle really working as an adjective. And over here, of course, 
It's really an adjective, an interesting book, just like a good book, a new book. And I am interested in that, just like I am happy. I am, you know, busy. So we can see here how um, this all works, whether you do this with your students or this is something that helps you explain it. How would you explain it? Well, the book is interesting, meaning what? It causes that feeling. It just The book has this quality, and then how do you feel inside? You are interested inside. That's your feeling. You are bored or confused. I'm going to go right from this quickly, because whenever I get into uh, deep grammar water, I try to get out of it when I'm thinking about my learners. I love to think about what we were just looking at, but I'm not sure. Wait, that's wrong. I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, in most cases, I'm super sure. <laughs> Look at my adverbs here with my adjectives. Uh, that for learners, that's not always the best course. A better course to take is back to chunking and collocations. A boring what? An interesting what? It could be people, but it's not as often people, right? And that's where you get the, you know, I'm boring. No, you mean I'm bored, right? And that mistake, instead of correcting it, I think the best way is to get a lot of meaningful practice, repetition with collocations. So a boring what, an interesting what, an exciting what, a tiring what, a confused, right? Whoop. I chose these three uh, nouns because they are super high frequency. If you watch my noun, uh, my American Tissot Institute uh, noun presentation, right? You, you Maybe you remember uh, the most common nouns, again, according to Coco, are time, year, people, way, day, man, thing, woman, life, child, right? So here are three in the top 10. And uh, not surprisingly, we can collocate those with high-frequency adjectives. So if we had something like an annoying, Annoying is a great adjective in the ing form. An annoying time of year? Not really, an annoying person. But I just thought for fun, I would show you something where you can really chunk any of these adjectives with these nouns. You can think of games and different activities where you're helping students do this. This is sort of the test. I think this helps a lot. Instead of getting into sort of linguistic language, for students with what's the difference between ing and ed adjectives, right? Well, what's it like? What was it like? Mm. Here we have present, so let's stay present. It's boring, it's exciting, it's exciting. Sorry, it's boring. <laughs> let, me, let me rewind that. It's boring, it's interesting, it's exciting, it's tiring, it's confusing, it's disappointing. This is, now, rote learning here is not the point. It's like, what would you do with this? Now, for me, I make songs, I make games, and I make stories. But it could also just be a way to show them and then have them come up with other ideas or to make sentences. Continue. It's boring to do what? Okay. It's boring. What's boring? Uh, this book is boring. On the other hand, this book is really interesting. What's it like? What's the difference between ING and ED, really? What's it like versus how do you feel? And, you know, you want to think, do you want to be comparing those things or do you want to kind of keep them separate? What are the ages of your learners, their levels? But the point is, if you're analyzing, looking under the microscope too much at, you know, participle adjectives that come from verbs, I think it's not going to help them. How do you feel today? If they do this enough and their brains get kind of programmed, right? Then they're not going to say, I'm boring, I'm interesting. That's the key. Tip number five. Oh, and we're about halfway through, right on time. <laughs> this one I love. 
Don't teach an adjective order rule that students must memorize. So let me unpack this a little bit. <laughs> There's a lot here. Um, is there a, an adjective order that is kind of a rule? Or if not a rule, like, you know, super consistent. There is, and it's fascinating. And if you have... Uh, you know, if you're if you're training teachers like I do, this is definitely something you want to talk about with teachers. And as our audience here is mainly teachers, we're going to talk about it. But what do you communicate to your students? Do you tell them, OK, English has this perfect rule about which adjectives come in which order to describe nouns? If you know what I'm talking about, I think most of you do, because this is a, uh, you know, a very popular item when it comes to learning about adjectives and teaching adjectives. So let's get into it. But should they memorize it? I'm going to argue, really, they should not. It should not be something they think about. First of all, this is not something that someone who has English as a first language, a native speaker like myself, ever learns in school, ever thinks about consciously. Right? So this is one of those moments. Uh, other moments are with countable, uncountable nouns, uh, phrasal verbs. Um, there are many others. I'll just stop there where it's not something that's learned in school, taught to us directly, something that we learn consciously. It just happens. And when that happens, uh, it's a red flag as far as I'm concerned that it shouldn't be something that you as a teacher are teaching this way because it's complicated to do it that way. That's why it doesn't happen that way. Uh, we never learn a pin. We might learn like the colors of the, you know, light spectrum, the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue. Okay, that, that, you know, that kind of mnemonic. There's no mnemonic here. We don't have O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P. <laughs> this just never happens. However, it is fascinating that a sentence like my wonderful younger sister, if we say my younger wonderful, in other languages, it might not matter. Um, in other languages, it's like English. It's the order of adjectives does matter. Uh, English happens to have a very fixed order, and that is interesting. It's a big round wooden table. If you try to mix those adjectives up, it will not sound right. <laughs> it will the chunks will be all over the place. It will be wrong. Uh, but notice something in this last sentence, which looks a little strange, maybe. This is a sentence I wrote for a song and video I have about adjective clauses, relative clauses, but better known as adjective clauses, or should be known as adjective clauses. And I wrote this. And when I wrote this and put this in the song, some people, and I didn't do it as a way to teach word order. I was saying how it's more normal, it's more common to use an adjective clause to, to do something like this. But anyway, that's uh, a, another conversation. The important thing right now that I want to point out is that when I wrote this, and it sounded natural, as long as it is, it's pretty natural. I bought a new long black silk French nightgown. It's possible, and it definitely sounds bright. And of course, if you start to mix the adjectives up, it sounds completely insane. But does it follow this you know, rule? <laughs> Do you notice that it doesn't? Look at material and origin. So if you try to mix silk French, if you try to have it fit here in this order that you find everywhere in grammar books on the internet, it doesn't work. I actually had a couple of people point that out to me and say, wait, shouldn't it be I bought a new, a new long black French silk nightgown, French silk nightgown. Now, okay, I don't, I don't want to get into, uh, you know, we're splitting hairs here. Maybe, maybe it is better for some people, French silk. What's my point? My point is that having students memorize this and, God forbid, have to, on a test, say the order of the adjectives, no. First of all, we, look, I already said, first of all, we don't learn it this way. Second of all, how often do we have nouns modified by this many adjectives? What happens more often? Ooh, let's go back. What happens more often? 
adjective, adjective, noun. Now that's common, a comma between them. That's important when students write. Coordinating adjectives, that, that's something that uh, would be important to focus on, right? Maybe three, but that's also not a, that common. So, you know, we were talking before about adjective plus noun collocations, wonderful sister, younger sister, okay, maybe two. This is not an area of, of language learning that is in, so important, right? What's important is, okay, nightgown. Here are adjectives that could chunk with nightgown, but thinking about the word order, this is uh, not just low priority. As I said, I don't think it's something to, to get into. Unless you're training teachers and then it's very interesting. Tip number six. Ah, here we're getting into something much more useful. In my experience, uh, observing classes, te training teachers, uh, I I've seen wonderful, wonderful explanations um, from a grammatical point perspective on how comparatives and superlatives work in English. They work differently uh, in English uh, compared to many other languages. Uh, great books, uh, you know, uh, websites, PDFs, memes explaining uh, how, how it works. Uh, that's not what I want to focus on because that's out there, right? I want to focus on the practice component because um, those great explanations, when students read them, okay, this is how you form a comparative. Uh, let's just get to an example. This is how you form a superlative. So with uh, adjectives that are one syllable, sometimes more, we'll talk about that short in a moment. Uh, you know, you're adding this suffix, the ER or the EST to make a comparative a superlative. That can be very strange if, if you're not used to it. You do need to think about grammatically uh, how it works. However, many, many times I've also observed with great, uh, you know, context with how it works grammatically, uh, not enough practice so that students have the rule, but they don't have high accuracy and fluency when they're using these adjectives. That's why I wrote this song, Fresh, Fresher, Freshest. And uh, some people have said, but you're not teaching the grammar. Exactly. Oh, but you know, it's not really young, younger, youngest. It's the youngest also exactly. But what do they need to really remember? For me, it's those endings. And then it's up to you teachers uh, to help them and materials writers, textbook publishers. What are they going to do with that? Once it's up in their heads, that young, that younger sounds right. Youngest sounds right. Okay, I'm the youngest child in my family, right? Uh, I'm shy, but my friend is shyer, and uh, my other friend, she is the shyest person in our class. Like right? this, this is the point of a song like this. But the repetition, meaningful. I say meaning it's contextualized and a little bit of a story here. It's in a song. You know, I feel like, okay, if you're, there's this, there's the vocabulary level, there's the syntax level, right? And let's, let's go to the next slide here. So, you know, uh, here I have the longer adjectives, but let's say we don't, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, if we have easy and e it's easier than, right? I don't have the than here. I don't have the, the, uh, I'm not looking at this on a syntax level. So I don't know if when you're saying it's difficult, it's, it's difficult syntactically. Um, what I would say, if it is hard for them to complete it, you know, with the van or, you know, as good as with the, uh, is it called equalitives? I forget, <laughs> comparative superlatives. I don't think it's called equalitives. I'm forgetting now. Anyway, if you know, put it in the chat or put it in the comments. I mean, equitives, did I get it? But see, this is what I mean. Like, you know, if you're a learner, equitive, comparative, superlative, let's go <laughs> get into the, because these are so common, right, in every language. Let's just look at examples. So I, I don't, the than is important because in some languages, like in French, it's not than, it's as, and okay, people mix things up. But what I see happening all the time with lower level students, and let's get those lower level students, is that they just don't have, uh, it's not easy for them to use them in their writing and speaking. It's not easy to say it's, it's more important to do this, right? We don't, also don't always have the compliments with the full comparatives. Anyway, I think it's more difficult. Yeah, it's easier. More easy? No, easier. That's not a grammar thing as much, right, as, as getting repetitive exposure and practice. 
So I showed you this example, this, this is from a song I have where we're looking at it with the E-R-E-S-T. I, ha I don't have a song yet here, but you know, I'm, I hope to write one. Uh, it's more or less, I could have split this up into more or less and then another one, which is the most, the least. But notice the adjective doesn't change. So why not look at them this way? It's more important. Really? Is it the most important? Uh, I don't know. Um, this one is less important. Oh, and I think it's the least important. So I'm putting things this way in these tables, not because I think it's like, you know, you hand these tables to students and then, you know, suddenly they got it. Of course, that's the polar opposite of, of my approach and my point. But as teachers, right, you want to see things this way and um, I hope create uh, content materials or better navigate the materials in the books that you're using textbooks and other things where they may be focusing a little bit too much on uh, the grammar side of it. And that puts students off and not enough on the, uh, you know, repetitive practice with it. Deborah's comment, my learners are Spanish speakers, right? Mas y la mas. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> much easier in Spanish. Exceptions, exactly. Well, I've, I've taught many Spanish speakers, and I would say forget, uh, you know, error correction. <laughs> Give them lots of opportunity to practice the correct forms. Game songs, videos, dialogues, etc. Moving along. Here we go. Yes, we are still on collocations. <laughs> but how, how else to better teach and learn adjectives? What about adverbs? Well, another tip, not really, it didn't really, well, it didn't, it didn't make it into the top 10. You know, I like the alliteration, top 10 tips to teach. So we're doing 10. Uh, but another one might be looking at which adjectives is more, more advanced. Again, it's sort of under the microscope. Have L-Y, uh, like likely and unlikely. Here's one here. They're not adverbs. But when you have lower level students, it is a good idea. I, found, I have found to say, well, adverbs often have L-Y, not always, but they describe adjectives. Let's find some adverbs that describe these adjectives we have. You can say something is important, but it's really important. Now, higher level students, could you say it's extremely important? Yes. Completely important? No. But why? Best reason doesn't sound right. Other reason, getting more technical <laughs> into the difference between something is very and it is uh, emphasizing it and complete. Can something be uh, completely important? So that gets much more into the sort of philosophical <laughs> side of language and semantics. Not as important as I think your learners being able to quickly latch on to some of these great collocations. So here I'm not, as you see, I'm not going, these are not mix and match. Oop, where am I? There we go. These are not mix and match. Really important, extremely cold. I found a collocation that's very common for each of these adverbs. And adverbs do not have to always have L-O-Y. We hear we have quite. We have very, which is not on the list, and adjectives don't have to, oh, not every L-O-Y word is, a, is an adverb. Lovely is another example. Tip number eight. If you watched my noun, uh, American TESOL um, top tips, <laughs> top 10 tips for teaching nouns, then you may remember I focused a lot on quantifiers. Quantifiers, any opportunity to get into, you know, singular, plural, um, subject verb agreement that isn't the traditional grammar way is something that really appeals to me. So here's another opportunity. We talked about it with uh, teaching quantifiers when we're talking about nouns, which, coll which words collocate most with nouns, well, adjectives and quantifiers. So here we are again. We're I took the same slides from that presentation because really, if we're talking about, you know, important information, relevant information, 
We can also talk about too much information, so much information. How much should you talk about countable, uncountable? For me, it's, again, much more of a vocabulary issue. So here's, here's a list, not saying, okay, you have to decide what's countable and uncountable, especially for, uh, you know, beginning learners, uh, learners who are learning these nouns for the first time. Or maybe not the first, first time, but hopefully pretty soon, right? Look at how common these are. And these quantifiers, again, maybe not immediately, but pretty soon, please. <laughs> Let's not wait till later where they're making mistakes with them. And you won't be surprised to see the next slide is countable. And here, certainly, we can mix and match. So I should probably revise this to get rid of the lines so that it's clear that any of the ones on the left can go with any on the right and same with the countable nouns. If your learners are higher level or they've had enough practice, and this is really important because as I said, I, I don't think trying to choose between what is countable and what is uncountable is a good idea. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't raise awareness early about the ideas of countable and countable, but uh, beware. Um, anyway, the point is something like this, this kind of you know, a scramble where you're trying to match the uh, adjectives or quantifier adjectives in green with the nouns in blue. Uh, should not be something that's, you know, uh, laborious or confusing. Could be a cool thing to do and then go back here and look if you are already comfortable with this vocabulary. Tip number nine, and we're making good time with tip number nine. Give students meaningful practice. We saw this before with uh, comparative superlative, with sense verbs plus adjectives. What, why am I using this meaningful practice idea? Let me make sure that's clear. Because uh, I think there's a wealth of uh, information out there in books, in materials on, as we saw before, comparative and superlatives from a grammar point of view, uh, an explanation point of view. Uh, same thing here. So sense verbs, you can find a lot of information on verbs that uh, go with adjectives when verbs usually don't. We'll look at that in a moment. Maybe you're already thinking what uh, I mean here with sense verbs plus adjectives. What we don't see enough of, in my very strong opinion, is practice with them. And what I'm going to show you is not the way to do practice as much as where I think there should be practice and let's get into it. Something like this, not to uh, take this and just repeat it ad nauseum. No, that's old fashioned road learning. That's not the point. But if you and I agree that short sentences like this need to get in our learners' heads, then it's about what kind of games, you know, what kind of stories, dialogues, songs, what can happen so that these get contextualized? Of course, you can pull them out of context uh, they're in, in materials you may have in your books or that you've created, and that's great. But you can also create materials where students are getting repetitive practice. It looks good. It sounds good. It tastes good. It smells good. It feels good. What tastes good looks good, right? What is it? What is this? What is that? So the, the end result, right, I think we'll all agree, or I hope agree, is that students can make sentences like this quickly and accurately and fluently, but that doesn't mean just repeating them over and over is going to get them there, usually not. Notice the singular plural opportunity again. Would you want to mix them together or not? Depends. I chose these four adjectives because, of course, they're high frequency and work with all of these. But then what about taste? Is there anything that tastes, tastes good? Oh, it tastes delicious. It smells delicious. It sounds delicious. It looks delicious. It feels delicious. Hmm. 
It's also fun, again, higher levels maybe too, where they're considering what collocates and what doesn't, what sounds natural as a chunk, what is not really a chunk. Finally, tip number 10. I think I did this. I know I did this in the noun uh, webinar and maybe the verb one as well, where I just went chunking collocation <laughs> all the way, pretty much, right? Uh, even though some things weren't framed as chunking or collocation, in the end, that's really what they were. Uh, here, I'm talking about word building prefixes and suffixes. Though, of course, uh, if you watch those other <laughs> webinars, you'll know that I'll quickly say as far as practicing them, uh, it's not about memorizing rules about prefixes and suffixes, but more getting practice chunking these adjectives. But let me continue and explain. When it comes to adjectives and prefixes, there are different prefixes, but by far the most common are prefixes to mean the opposite. So if you're going to pick and choose, focus on something important, definitely it's the prefixes that denote an opposite meaning. So not or opposite of, not happy, the opposite of happy. It's interesting, the differences between un, in, in, er, and dis, er or ear, depending. We don't say er responsible or er relevant, it's more ear. Interesting where the I here becomes more of an E sound. Uh, but that's getting sort of into the phonetics. But you know what? Phonetics is what this is really all about. If you say, well, why do we have all these different prefixes um, when they mean the same thing? Uh, well, in the case of im and ear or er, we can, it's really just uh, phonetics. So why I am im is always with P. Or M. I didn't put any M examples here. Oh, that's my fault. So uh, immortal, uh, immobile, uh, immovable. Uh, why? Because I am, or I am, uh, these are bilabials, P and M. Is it easy for our mouths to do impolite, impossible? No. So what happened? 99% uh, sure in. And un were the original prefixes. Now, the difference between in and un, I don't really know. I have to go back and look because that's not phonetic. Why not uh, unconvenient or unaccurate? So I think if you look, you'll see un and in for whatever reason. Both came in as the opposite, whether it's something with Latin and Greek. I just don't know. Uh, but it is interesting, right, that when we look at I am and I are, we notice that... Uh, most likely what happened, right, is that the N kind of morphed into an M because it's too difficult for the mouth to say N plus P or N plus M. Sorry, I don't have the I M plus the M adjectives here. But an ear, right, same thing, right? Irresponsible, inner, inner, ear. Uh, so it's a phonetic reason. These all have exactly, they're, they're identical. This is a curious one. Uh, again, I think it's probably... Uh, different languages influencing English, right? And I'm not an, uh, an expert here. I'm not, I'm not obsessed. I'm obsessed with a lot of things in linguistics, but not etymology. You have to sort of, you know, have your priorities. Uh, so I'm just going to guess that words that have dis came in, again, whether it's Latin, Greek, or whatever it is, in a different way. Uh, dishonest, disabled, could it be uh, enabled or unabled uh, in terms of meaning? It absolutely could, right? So here it comes, guys. Is this something your students should be thinking about all the time? Are we under the microscope? Or are we just getting a lot of practice with the words over on the green side? Uh, once they know that these are mean the opposite, uh, that's what I strongly suggest. We've talked about prefixes. So what's next? Suffixes. 
And here I'm going to be even more <laughs> intent on convincing you that your approach and what will help students most is not thinking so much about uh, the meanings of suffixes or prefixes or affixes, if we're going to use a word for everything. What is important here, if you have students who are preparing for standardized tests like the TOEIC, TOEIC's a good example, or uh, the Bulats, oh, excuse me, which is now Lingua Skill, those are two business exams, or other tests, is it important uh, to know the difference between a noun, a verb, an adjective, and an adverb? Uh, it absolutely can help with test preparation. And with certain first languages, also, it could be more important to think about uh, these endings. Uh, no matter what, for everyone, um, especially teachers, it's important to know which suffixes create adjectives and for you to be aware of that to help you in your teaching. Uh, but even if you're a teacher, I'm not sure how much value this column has, which is why it's, it's in this different font copied and pasted from a website. Excuse me. What's important here to me, and, and again, and this is a good time to mention, as I usually do earlier, and I don't think I did. I failed to do that today. My tips here, top 10 tips, it, I'm certainly not suggesting that these are the best or most important. This is purely based on my experience. I have been teaching a long time and training teachers a long time, but anyway. Um, so in my experience, uh, it is good, especially for teachers, to understand that these are the most common endings for adjectives. As far as the meanings, when we're looking at these meanings that I copied and pasted from a website, we already see how for learners this could be confusing and maybe irrelevant and at worst, uh, you know, deceiving or confusing or misleading. Uh, so, you know, without missing worth ability, here we have quality relation, another quality relation. What's really important is, hey, there are many adjectives that are formed with A-B-L-E and I-B-L-E, um, and they sound the same. And native speakers will make spelling mistakes here because believable, sensible, it's not believe able or able, all right? It's believable, it's the schwa, because the stress is believe. I uh, didn't talk a lot about pronunciation today. I wanted to, but I thought it wouldn't be enough time. But here, we can do a little bit here. So because the stress is on believe, right, we have a reduced sound in the suffix. Same thing here, sensible. So we have a, a. And for people like me, <laughs> my first language is English. Uh, it's not always easy to know. Is it I, B, L, E, or, or A, B, L, E? Uh, A, L, professional, radical. I am glossing over the uh, meanings over here. Again, I put them in because they're out there. Uh, I don't suggest using them so much. E N T A N T. Uh, when we talked about nouns, uh, we talked about how this sounds the same also. So dependent, important, uh, A N T E N T. It's the E eh sound, it's the short E. It's not dependent, important. Um, I see historic, idealistic and down the line. Ish is interesting. That's very uh, English, isn't it? English, right? But English, that's different, right? When we want to take a word and we can put ish on almost any adjective to mean, again, having the character of almost about. Not as good as saying, okay, well, this is not really new. It's newish. This is not really red. It's reddish. F-U-L-L-E-S-S -S looks like a great rule, but, you know, not every word has a uh, full or less. You can't just slap it on and have it work. What are the common words that your students need? That's where we started off with tip number one and down the line, especially with collocations. We're going to end here, as we always do, with our maxim. Our credo, or at least mine. <laughs> Shout out to Chuck Sandy who came up with this. Practice builds accuracy when you do repetition, preferably meaningful repetition. Preferably meaning rep meaningful repetition with uh, language that was in context, a story, a song, uh, for example, a movie. 
and you get that meaningful repetition and you become more accurate. You can remember it better. You can pronounce it better. You can understand it better. You can read it more quickly. What happens? You're more confident. That confidence means that you're more likely to speak in English, write in English. So glad you guys are here with me again for this series, not exactly a, a, a official series, but a, a series nonetheless, top 10 tips for teaching. We've done top 10 tips for teaching nouns, verbs, and adjectives now, and uh, I want to get into adverbs soon, and maybe even uh, some other, other parts of speech, other areas of, of English. Thank you so much to you uh, guys who are here live. Really appreciate that. Uh, to the rest of you, to most of you who are watching this as an edited recording, really appreciate your support. Enormous thanks to American Teasel Institute for these webinars. Uh, thanks so much for uh, letting me be your host, bringing me on here. And uh, to all of you watching live or watching the recording, have a wonderful day wherever you are. Those of you who are here live, it's Friday. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Take good care, peace, respect. See you next time.